Andy Johnson. I'm talking about Freud today, and there are some ideas of his that we can use. Remember, every theory is a little bit right and a little bit wrong. Psyche literally means soul. Psyche was a goddess who traveled to the underworld. Psychology technically is a study of soul. So think about it. How did they explain mental illness in the Middle Ages and before they tended to use their paradigm, which they tended to view reality and all things in terms of religion. Religion was the science that explained things. And Freud uh, lived uh, 1856 to 1939. This is kind of the pre-psychology time. He was one of the pioneers. In his time and before his time, all abnormal behavior was explained in religious terms. Religion was the science of the day. In 1881, 1880s, he started studying uh, hysteria, and he used hypnosis. He found that this was one of the few tools available to science at the time. He found that under hypnosis or using hypnosis, some of the physical symptoms of hysteria decreased, or this helped them identify or recall unpleasant memories. It wasn't a cure, but it was a step towards understanding. He came up with a lot of terms that are in common parlance today. Catharsis is one of them. This sudden freeing of repressed material. All of a sudden, you understand. Sudden insight, way of seeing, that's called a catharsis. Uh, free association, that's one way to get to the repressed or the unconscious. Subject matter is released. Free verbalization, thoughts, the first thing that comes to your mind without the logical mind get in the way. And he used the couch, which kind of made the therapist disappear. The therapist was just a voice sitting behind the person there and there, minimal distraction. And he encouraged free association to get beyond the ego, beyond logical thinking, to remember and remember, member up again with events that were hidden in the unconscious mind. Of course, mental disorder, he used talk therapy instead of exorcism. First time in history that mental disorders that produced physical symptoms were treated by talk therapy. So he was the first to make psychology a science based out of systematic observation or on systematic observation. Psychology grew out of the field of philosophy. He learned that the scientific method or a method of science could look at human thoughts and behaviors. And let's look at mental health, mental illness in the early days. How did they deal with mental health issues? Wasn't very pleasant. That was the science of the day. The science of the day, how they dealt with mental illness. Insane asylums, lock them up, make them disappear the cruel things that were done to people with mental illness, mental health conditions. Those weren't necessarily the good old days if you were a person with a mental health condition. So the uncomfortable part of Freud, and you know, Freud used his best to explain stuff Theories are a little bit right, a little bit wrong. And he talked about uh, looking at childhood sexuality and that stuff. And most people don't put stock in that today. We can interpret that as a creative part of ourself that always wants to grow, evolve, and learn. Uh, he chose to use the word libido as that and put sexual connotations there. Most people do not do that. And he can be understood, I think, in a more positive way. If you understand libido, not in a sexual sense, but as a creative sense, this creative drive, this self-actualization, that helps me better understand and make sense of this theory. So his contribution to psychology, much of human behavior arises out of the unconscious. That was his contribution. Now, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, there's some Freud stuff that is just uncomfortable. We don't agree with it. But don't throw it out because he does have some good stuff to understand and realize and come to remember again. Again, his contribution 
to the study, to the field of psychology, was that much of human behavior arises out of the unconscious. To understand our own selves and behaviors, we need to understand our unconscious mind. His goal was to help us understand ourselves, to face the dragon, <clears throat> to free ourselves from unconscious forces. Now, we don't get rid of the dragon by running from him or killing the dragon. We have to face the dragon ourselves, embrace the dragon, become one with all parts of ourselves. And there is a time of chaos. This discomfort is often the first step towards growth, towards realization. Chaos, discomfort, war in heaven, that could be depression, anxiety, those things which often lead to a higher state. <clears throat> So some of the basics, of course, the human mind has two parts, the conscious and the subconscious, which is below consciousness. The power of the unconscious is we operate in the conscious area, but it is the subconscious, below consciousness, which accounts for much of our behavior. And he had three parts of consciousness, and we'll look at that, but much of the human consciousness is below water, like an iceberg, below awareness in the subconscious or unconscious mind. Now, his three parts, the id, that's the Homer Simpson part, basic desires, the most primitive or instinctive part of the personality, operates on the pleasure principle, seeks pleasure regardless of the societal strengths, this drive for food, for sleep, for sexual pleasure, or for beer. And I use that to understand the creative part of us that wants to create as well. Now, the ego is the part of the personality that faces the world. It's a problem-solving part, operates on the reality uh, principle, seeks pleasure while avoiding pain, takes the demands of the id, id and finds ways to satisfy it. But then there is the superego, which is the Lisa Simpson, the internalized ideals that we inquire, acquire from parents, society, as to what is successful. And that reminds the person of the ideals or ideal behaviors. It tries to block some of these aggressive impulses. And you see an example of the ego, the id, the most primitive part, and the superego. And the superego is kind of a, a link between the two. It helps us understand. Uh, personality, of course, is motivated throughout life by one's fundamental drives. This energy source, this psychic energy to achieve goals, not necessarily sexual energy, but that's how he chose to interpret it. But it's still an instinctive drive, however we choose to define it. Self-actualization, creativity, a drive towards our higher self. Pleasure principle, we do what feels good. Reality principle tells us to subordinate or sublimit pleasure uh, to, to do what needs to be done instead. That's the reality principle. Now, here are uh, some important concepts and terms that he contributed <clears throat> and that we use commonly today. Repression is forgetting that is imprinted or prompted by unconscious force. An event is no longer accessible to the conscious mind. We have tapped it down. Projection, you project attributes onto another person that are unacceptable to ourselves. We project them on. We don't like this trait in ourselves and we project that onto other people. <clears throat> Reaction form, uh, formation, you act in a way that is in total contradiction to the way that you feel unconsciously. Intellectualization. You see or describe a situation without emotion, a highly charged event. You use detached language to protect the unit. It's all to protect the emotional unit. Intellectualization. Uh, denial. You deny that it happened. You deny that it even happened. You have no insight. This happens a lot in abusive relationships with children, substance abuse, etc. We just deny that it ever happened. We tap her deep down. Rationalization, you develop false explanations for actions or behaviors. You say, well, that's okay because this happens a lot when you're stuck within a political or religious organization. They start doing bad stuff, but you're able to rationalize, well, I did that because of that and that stuff. And a displacement, you shift your anger or strong feelings from one object or source to another. You're angry at this, but you take it out on that instead. 
conversations, you feel deficient in one of your areas, and you cover it up by emphasizing another area. A person who is physically weak often comes an emotional bully. That is compensation. And identification. You confuse your ability to identify with, with the identity of someone else. Individual, uh, you, you cannot, your individual identity, you're not able to grasp that, so you project onto someone else. Uh, you incorporate your own personality into or with someone else's values and beliefs. All right?